greetings, Advent greetings on this first Sunday in Advent, which also marks the first Sunday of a new church year, a year in which we uh, look to the Gospel of Mark in our Gospel readings. Uh, much of the year we'll focus on that Gospel. Today, another one of those difficult readings like we've had in uh, recent weeks uh, that seem to have to do with end times, or it sure sounds that way, and and all of that sort of uh, gloom and doom stuff that are related to the word apocalypse, a word that most people assume means the end of the ages or the end of the time. Actually, the word apocalypse is a word that just simply means revealing, like an unveiling of something so that you can see it clearly and it can be known. And Advent is like that, and the Sundays are the end of the year that come up to Advent, and now these Sundays in Advent, like a great revealing that shows us God's plan and purpose for his creation, a plan that will reach its fulfillment in the birth of a child, and then again in that second coming of that one, that promised one, the anointed one. So revealing and apocalypse are not frightening things. They're hopeful things, and this is a season that is pregnant with longing and expectation and hope. And we'll hear that in today's Gospel. I'll do my best to struggle with that in this Gospel reading from Matthew 13. Until And Chris is going to share with you one tradition that I, I hope that you all can take up at home, and many of you do already, the tradition of the Advent wreath. Until then, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Greetings, dear congregation and family of Trinity Lutheran Church. How good to be gathered together as we come into the Advent season, a time of pondering and prayer and thinking and wondering and waiting. As Pastor Bill mentioned, this is also the season when we begin to have our Advent wreaths out and Advent candles, and we're hoping that in your home you can do something like this and have Advent candles that you light one more each Sunday. This Sunday we have this candle lit, next Sunday we'll have two, and the third Sunday and the fourth Sunday, reminding us that as we gather together in the light of Christ, the light of Christ grows and is sent out. You might use candles like this. You might use candles of multiple colors and multiple shapes. It doesn't have to be anything perfect, but it can be something as simple as this. And I think I've got... Now, I want you to just know that these beautiful little um, standards for the candles, these votive candles, were made by Dwayne Johnson, our beloved and greatly missed friend from Trinity who died this past year. But he made these about... 10 years ago, and we use them all the time. That's all it takes, a simple place in your home to have prayer and a remembrance of the Advent season. People of God, let us pray. Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. By your merciful protection, awaken us to the threatening dangers of our sins and keep us blameless until the coming of your new day. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And one more thing I forgot. Uh, Mark will just bear with me. If you have something like a cell phone, or a camera, we would really love to have a picture of you sent to us that would show you lighting an Advent candle. And we can then share it and see that all of us around this country are doing this not at the same moment, but in the same season of Advent. So, we thank you. Thanks. Blessed are you, God of Jacob, for your promise to transfer weapons of war into implements of planting and harvest, and to teach us your ways of peace. 
your promise that our night of sin is far gone and that your day of salvation is drawing near. As we light the first candle on this wreath, wake us from your sleep. Wrap us in your light. Empower us to live honorably and to guide us along your path of peace. O house of Jacob, come. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. Amen. Our first reading for this first Sunday in Advent from the Old Testament, the Hebrew Testament, is from Isaiah chapter 64. In this reading we will hear a lament that comes from a people who have had their hopes shattered. The visions of a rebuilt Jerusalem and a renewed people of God spoken in Isaiah 40 through 55 have not yet been realized among the people. Instead, the people experienced ruin, conflict, and famine. Their lament calls God to account, to be the God who has brought deliverance in the past. Our reading from Isaiah chapter 64. Oh, that you would tear down the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence as when the fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There was no one who calls on you by your name or attempts to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. Word of God, word of life. Our second reading comes from the letter the Apostle Paul wrote to the people of Corinth. As they were awaiting the advent of Jesus, Paul was reminding them how the Lord had already enriched them through spiritual gifts and will continue to strengthen them until the coming day of our Lord. Paul's writings to the first Corinthian, to the Corinthians. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Word of God, word of life.
The Gospel for this first Sunday in Advent is from the 13th chapter of Mark's Gospel. In it, Jesus encourages his followers, his disciples, to look forward to a day when his second coming, his return, will be a return in power and glory to end all suffering. Jesus has these words for his disciples. In those days, he said, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his own work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cock crow, or at dawn or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I love Advent. I always have. I love going out and finding a tree. I love setting up my grandmother's old glass Advent wreath and getting out the nativity scenes and the decorations. I love the old record of Advent lessons and carols from England that we've had in my family since I was a little kid. And all of those beautiful passages from the prophet Isaiah that speak of a future hope. Getting ready. That's what Advent is all about, right? Waiting and watching in anticipation of something to come. And maybe you need to have a certain sort of a personality to enjoy that kind of thing. I've, I've always been kind of a loner. Even as a young kid, I would spend hours on the backyard swing, just pondering and dreaming, dreaming and imagining the future and what it might bring. I suppose I have a kind of an Advent personality. Well, faith itself is a kind of an Advent sort of thing. Our faith is really synonymous with hope. Hope is really all we've got as Christians. And it's a hope that waits in anticipation about what God has to do, what God is about to do. And I guess we've all grown pretty accustomed to waiting after 2,000 years. Well, the people of Israel that Isaiah addresses in our Old Testament reading they were a people that were badly, badly in need of hope, of some kind of sign that their longings and their expectations would be fulfilled. They were truly accustomed to waiting. And by the time that 64th chapter got written, just a few hundred years before Christ, their hopes had been dashed by all sorts of injustice and destruction and despair as the rich got richer and the poor got poorer and the powerful more and more corrupt by each day. Theirs was a predicament that sounds pretty familiar to us today. And so Isaiah speaks to God and says, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. In other words, God, why aren't you doing something? Why won't you come and do something? 
Anxiety has become a very common and pervasive thing in our world today, just as it was back then. One of those ailments that drug companies have prescriptions for in TV commercials to offer a quick fix. And I recently read that young people today, and even very young children, are experiencing anxiety more than in any previous generation. And you know what? I get it. Think about what those kids have to worry about. And it's not just the childhood that they've been cheated out of in this time of COVID-19, but the daily news that offers up a grim reality of climate change and fires and hurricanes and homelessness and corrupt world leaders and shootings and racism and riots and fear and on and on. What must our children think of all of the bitterness and anger and division in our country, in our world? It must seem like everybody is at war with one another. And so that we hear this ply from, plea from the prophet Isaiah, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. Why, in other words, won't you do something, God? Well, the Bible says that the age we live in is a very fragile setup, and it's coming to an end. The old is going to give way to something new. But God says, wait, and we're not good at waiting. The prophet says, they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. See, the great gift of Advent is that it teaches us to wait when we are children for the presence under the tree, and when we are older and our childlike wonder has been ransomed by disappointment and anxiety, we wait for that servant whom God has chosen, the one who will not fail or be discouraged, we are told, the one who is coming in the clouds with great power and glory. This 13th chapter of Mark, our gospel reading for today, is a really strange chapter. After a series of controversies described in chapter 12, Jesus issues these severe warnings to his disciples, warnings about a future when his followers might be turned over to authorities and be beaten, to a time when they will stand before kings and governors to bear testimony. And the warnings also prophesy about families and family strife, parents and children pitted against one another because of the gospel. They go even further to a time when there will be false Christs and false prophets who prematurely announce that the end is come. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come. God, why won't you do something? Well, like a lot of you, I had a lot of time on Thursday to think about the past and to remember all those past Thanksgiving holidays through the years. How strange it was, was it not? My mother said that this was the first time in 92 years that she's not had a Thanksgiving with a house full of family. And so I smiled when I remembered one of those celebrations at my brother's house maybe a decade or so ago. As my parents and my sister and I were driving the two hours home from there back then, I remember my sister Lisa asking me in the car what I was going to preach about on Sunday. It was going to be the first Sunday of Advent, as it usually is, right after Thanksgiving. Well, I was trying to take a nap in the back seat, so I sarcastically said to her, God. And my father, who was also trying to take a nap, chuckled. But then I said, well, you know, it's Advent, so I suppose I'll be talking about doom and gloom. And here I am, a decade later, talking about doom and gloom. But there is no escaping it in today's Gospel reading. There's no chance we're going to pretty it up and make it all nice and tidy. Jesus warns his followers that difficult times are ahead. And signing up to be one of his disciples is not going to excuse us from trouble. It might, in fact, mean even more trouble. Well, a few verses before today's reading, 
Jesus tells his disciples that this, that this is the beginning of the birth pangs. And in that image, everything changes with regard to our anxiety and our de despair. See, birth pangs are indeed painful, but boy, are they full of hope and expectation, even a little bit of longing. History is like that, like the birth of a child, and Advent, too, is all about the birth of a child. And the closer you get to that great moment, the greater the pain. Our present pain, St. Paul said, is the prelude to the birth of a new age. He went on to say that the whole creation, in fact, groans in travail as in the pains of childbirth. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, we cry. And in our pain, we wonder why, oh God, won't you do something to rescue a world in need? Well, Advent, is our birth pangs, our time to ponder and to understand that God has indeed done something, he has come to our rescue, come to save us from our despair, to share our pain and our suffering, and yes, even our death. Advent is a little portrayal of our whole life of faith, a life that is pregnant with hope and anticipation. And so that leaves just one little piece of advice in the text today that Jesus gives to his disciples when he says, keep awake, keep alert, be on guard. And here's the context of that. In an Eastern household in Jesus' day, and everybody knew this, when the master was away, it was the duty of the head servant to keep awake until the master returned. And at his return, the servant would open the door to welcome his homecoming. And at this gesture, the master was given the assurance that the house had been properly managed and guarded while he was away. Jesus uses this analogy as an example of our mission as his followers, that like the head servant of a household, we are stewards of an estate that does not belong to us. And like that head servant, we have a great privilege because it is through us that the master returns. You are my door openers, Jesus is saying in effect, so don't fall asleep. This means that we Christians live pretty much like the rest of the world does. We commit ourselves to making a living, taking care of property, raising families, being good citizens, etc. But we do it with a different attitude, with a different motive than does the worldly person who has no faith. For those people, the world of acquisition and achievement and security becomes itself a god and a delusion. The follower of Christ knows that that life and all of life's things are passing away. And yet, in spite of that, we know what the Master has given us to do while he is away. The house we're meant to take charge of is the house of our own lives, which we are asked to keep open to him, our unique calling and our role to play in God's unfolding history. So being awake, being alert, is being faithful to your given task as parent and neighbor as citizens and stewards of God's creation, as workers with him in his kingdom, doing whatever it is he's called you to do. It is anticipating his coming again and again into our lives each new day. And like that mother in childbirth, sleep is the last thing on her mind as she approaches that miracle, full of hope, even in the midst of great pain. So, too, for us, as we await the miracle that God has in store for us. Stir up your power and come, we pray, Lord, in this Advent season. Come into our homes and into our hearts. Come into our workplaces and our stations in life. Come and find us ready and awake. 
Come, Lord Jesus, in the name of God, the Creator, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's Gospel reading is a call from Jesus to keep awake, to stay awake, and so what better hymn on this first Sunday of Advent than the old chorale, Wake Awake for Night is Flying, number 436 in our book. It goes back centuries in the Lutheran Church, both the text and the tune written by Philip Nikolai. It's called the Queen of Chorales. The King of Chorales is also one written by Philip Nikolai. And by the time of Bach, this was already a very well-known and beloved hymn. Uh, three stanzas. The first one talks about the bride and the bridegroom and those virgins who came without oil in their lamps and a cry to be ready, to be ready for the bridegroom. We heard that text a couple of weeks ago. Stanza two are images that are very uh, close to our readings for today, especially from the prophet Isaiah. In the time of Bach and before, congregations would sing these chorales without any accompaniment at all and uh, just in unison. And so the organ would only have to give a pitch so they knew where to start singing, but you wouldn't waste your time to just give a pitch on the organ since it, it took a while for the volunteers to pump and get the airflow moving. If you're gonna get the air going in an organ, you might as well play something. And so tr uh, the tradition of playing a little flourish, a little prelude uh, on, based on the hymn grew and developed in the church. And by the time of Bach was widespread. So the organist would play something based on the hymn after which the people would sing. And I'm gonna just give you a little verse from this hymn just in unison. I'll give myself the pitch with the first measure of a chorale prelude written by Bach and then I'll follow it with that chorale prelude. Wake, awake, for night is flying. Zion hears the watchman singing, and all her heart with joy is springing. She wakes, she rises from her gloom, her dear friend comes down all glorious, the strong in grace, in truth victorious. Her star is risen, her light is come. Now come, O blessed one, Lord Jesus, God's own Son, sing Hosanna. Oh, hear the call, come one, come all, and follow to the banquet hall.
creator of the stars, bless your advent waiting. The long-expected Savior fill you with love. The unexpected Spirit guide your journey, now and forever. Let us go forth in peace to prepare the way of the Lord. Amen.